Uh, good morning. Hello, hello. How are you? Doing well? Oh, good. Uh, I love coming to uh, Bengaluru. I love uh, eating my masala dosa and my sambar and my vadu. I could just eat the entire time I'm here. So how many of you, is this your first time here at Gids? Show of hands. How many of you first time? Oh, I love seeing that. Welcome. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, I hope you enjoy yourself all day today. Um, but it's always fun hearing the keynotes at the very beginning, so you get an opportunity to think big thoughts before you get into keystrokes, before you get into curly braces and semicolons. There are going to be lots of curly braces and semicolons uh, all day today, but uh, I hope you'll uh, join me in, in thinking some big thoughts to begin. Everyone have their coffee and tea this morning? Yes, you're, you're, you're uh, ready and willing to begin thinking so early in the morning? Yes? Okay, very good. Well, my name is Scott Davis. I've been coming here for six years now. Uh, uh, six years running for uh, GIDS in the spring and then MODS, the Mobile Developer Summit, uh, in the fall. I have absolutely fallen in love with Bengaluru. Um, I run a consultancy in Denver, Colorado called Thirsty Head. I've uh, written a number of books. And uh, recently, I have been spending my time focusing on the mean stack. How many of you are familiar with the mean stack? Oh, very good. Yes, MongoDB, ExpressJS, AngularJS, and Node.js. Uh, I have several talks on Mean uh, later today. You'll hear uh, Mead talks throughout the conference. So I hope to see you back for uh, a Mean discussion later on. But we're here not to talk about Mean this morning. We're here to talk about testing. And who better to uh, help us discuss testing than uh, uh, Mark Twain, right? Noted software developer. Yeah? No, he's not a noted software developer at all. But he says, everyone always talks about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. It's kind of like complaining about how hot it is in Chennai, right? Uh, why bother complaining? Of course it's hot, and there's nothing you can do about it. So why bother complaining? Now, Mark Twain obviously was a famous author later in life, but early in life, he was a software developer. And uh, he said this about testing. He says, everyone talks about testing their software, but no one does anything about it. Now, the difference between testing your software and the heat in Chennai is that there's something you can do about testing your software, right? How many of you write unit tests on your software? I can wait. Everyone raise your hand, please. Everyone raise your hand, please. Yes, we all test our software, don't we? Um, it's very important. And hopefully what you'll get out of this are some inspiration to go back and begin testing your software because there weren't nearly enough hands that go up. Let me explain to you a couple of uh, uh, not very effective ways to test your code first. You're familiar with compiler testing, right? Yeah? Oh, well, if the compiler you know, says my code is OK, it must be OK. Is that really unit testing? No, not at all. That's just making sure you didn't make any punctuation errors. Have you ever opened up a new book and said, oh, the punctuation in this book was fabulous. And I love the width of the margins and all the font they use. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, that has nothing to do with the quality of the book, does it? And so trying to explain to someone that the compiler passed, the compiler said my software had lots of quality involved with it, that's a very low bar to set, isn't it? All right, well, if compiler testing isn't what you do, maybe you do visual testing, right? Otherwise known as code reviews. How many of you do code reviews? Yes, where we all sit around the room and we stroke our beards wisely, even the women, we stroke our beards wisely and we look at the code and make sure that it looks okay. Is that a very effective form of uh, unit testing? No. That would be like taking your car to the mechanic and saying, I'm having a problem with it. And all the mechanics get together and stroke their beard and they say, ah, we know exactly what the problem is. With ever, having, with ever not having run the car, that's kind of what code reviews are like as well. Code reviews tend to catch things like variable names, naming conventions, things like that, but not a very effective way to do unit testing. Ah, this is my favorite. Especially if you're a JavaScript developer, right? All of the JavaScript was written back in 1996. From this point forward, it's just been copy and pasted around. Yes? And this is an incredibly effective form of unit testing, right? Because if it worked over there, 
on a blog, right? It must work over here in your code base, right? It's been tested already. No, no, that's not unit testing either. So what I'd like to do is give us the top five reasons why developers don't test their code, and maybe this will inspire you to change your ways. This, of course, is David Letterman. He's retiring this year. So I figured as an homage to Mr. Letterman, I would give you, he, he always does the top 10 lists. I'm only giving you the top five list because I'm half as clever as David Letterman, OK? Yeah. But let's spend some time talking about the top five reasons why developers don't test their code. The number five reason, it takes too much time to write the code. We're all very busy, aren't we? We all have managers breathing down our necks saying, where's that next feature? Where's that next feature? We don't have time to write unit tests, do we? Oh, I hope we do. I hope we do, because if you don't have time to write unit tests, that's like saying we value code quantity over quality. How does that sound? Does that sound right? No, no. I just uh, got done working with a colleague who um, worked for the Department of Defense in the United States. True story. He says we were not allowed to go in and refactor our code. We were not allowed to go in and delete any code from the code base. And do you know what the reason was? The US government said we already paid for that code. <laughs> it's our property, not yours. How many of you think that's a good way to do software development? No, I love it when we're able to remove code and more code and more code. So yes, we shouldn't be valuing quantity over quality, but that's exactly what your manager is telling you when he says, oh, we don't have time for you to write unit tests. Just keep writing more code. That doesn't sound very effective at all, does it? Because if you don't write your unit tests, you're going to end up with bugs and lots of them. This is a study that came out about 10 years ago. They said that just in the US alone, they estimate that bugs cost the US economy $60 billion. That's what you get when you favor quantity over quality. And what makes this problem even more insidious is that if you read the fine print down here, they said improvements in testing could reduce this cost by about a third. So just by writing unit tests, we could reduce the number of bugs. I know that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But I mean, we have to say these things. They are obvious, and yet we still aren't doing them. And I think part of the reason why programmers don't unit test their code is this last sentence here. Of the total 60 billion, it was users that incurred two thirds of the cost. You know, open source, we say programmers write software to scratch their own itch, right? They have a problem that they need to solve, and so they write software to solve it. Well, what happens if your bugs aren't making you itch? What if the code you write is making some complete stranger itch? Are you concerned about that? Well, maybe you should be. Maybe if you're a good person, you should be. But the fact that bugs and the cost of bugs don't affect us directly makes it harder for us to care about code quality. So let me turn this equation around a little bit. Let me talk about the cost of bugs to us, software developers. How many of you are software developers? How many of you write code for a living? Ah, good. So you'll relate to this. You know that if you aren't writing unit tests, and when you're in that groove, you're writing code, and everything is going well, you feel like a superhero, don't you? I am the greatest software developer that has ever walked the face of the earth until you hit that first bug. And then what happens to your productivity? Whoop! It comes to a screeching halt, doesn't it? So that idea that we don't have time to write unit tests because we're so productive is a false argument. You're productive until you run into problems. And then you are not productive at all. And the inverse of this graph is what about the cost? Not in terms of money, not in terms of $40 billion, but what about the cost of your bugs over the course of the project? 
The cost of software development is very low as long as you're coding as fast as you can, but the minute your productivity drops to zero, the cost of that change skyrockets. And later in the project, it can be harder to make those changes than earlier. Let's say that you are three months away from going live in production, and your boss comes in and says, ah, yeah, we're going to change from Oracle to MongoDB. Do you think that would cause any problems? So late to the delivery date? Yeah, the cost of that change without unit tests is almost infinite. So what if we change the equation a little bit? What if we are writing unit tests as we go along? You'll see that your productivity will drop. Most studies say that the time it takes you to write unit tests, it doesn't drop your productivity down 50% or 75% or 90%. They say on average it takes about 15, maybe 20% uh, down on your, uh, on your productivity. So yes, so your productivity does go down a little bit. But what happens is that productivity is normalized because you are building up unit tests. As those bugs change, you're able to very quickly see where that bug happens. So what that means are the cost of finding bugs over the life of the, life of the product is actually much lower because you are isolated to bugs that happened within the last sprint, within the last week or two. Does that make sense? Yeah? So this idea that we don't have time to write unit tests is absolutely a fallacy. How do you have time not to write unit tests? Because software is all about being resilient to change. I was giving a mean uh, lecture in Boston, Massachusetts a, a month or so ago, and someone came up to me and they said, yes, we're very interested in this mean stack. As a matter of fact, all the architects have gotten together and they're trying to pick the web platform we're going to use for the next eight years. I said, really? A web platform for eight years? Well, I recommend Internet Explorer 6 then, because clearly that can't be killed. That is the browser that's going to live forever. So if you're looking for an eight-year commitment, go with IE6 and be done with it. Don't go with IE6, right? That was a joke, yeah? Uh, uh, software is all about being resilient to change. And that's what unit tests buy you. They buy you that resilience to be fearless as you need to make changes to your code base, as you inevitably We'll have to. You've heard this joke before, haven't you? You ask your manager to pick any two, right? OK, I want this uh, project um, quickly. All right, so it needs to be uh, fast, right? Well, it needs to be good as well. Well, it ain't going to be cheap, is it? And if it's fast and cheap, it ain't going to be good. And if it's good and cheap, it ain't going to be fast, right? So most managers, you say you can have any two of these on the screen. And while that's fine, I usually like presenting it this way to my clients when I'm sitting down. They said, how many of these features we're talking about, how many of them would you actually like to work? I said, well, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? Well, if you're favoring code quantity over quality, that's another way of saying, I want as many features as I can, and only some of them have to work. Yeah? I much prefer this picture because notice that the number of features that work is exactly the same. And if you have good tests, you can start with a very small product, an MVP, a minimum viable product, and then add features over time. We expect these things to grow iteratively. And when they grow, of course, each one of the new features is tested as well to make sure that every feature we have added is not just code, not just lines of code, but actually code that works. What a concept. So in order to understand unit testing, in order to understand testing in general, there are a couple of different kinds of tests out there. I want to focus on unit testing, because this is the type of test that we programmers should be writing. We'll get an opportunity to talk about functional tests and acceptance tests as well, but unit tests are absolutely the tests we should be responsible for as software developers. And so a really good definition is one straight off of Wikipedia that says the goal of unit testing is to isolate 
each part of the program and show that each individual isolated part is correct. This is a really important concept and one that we're going to come back to several times throughout this presentation. The idea of being able to take a big blob that is your application and hone it down to an individual method call and being able to understand all of the dependencies to make that method call and what you're going to get out of that method call. So of course a unit test is dealing with inputs and outputs and assertions. And this is hard to do. This is hard to do because we think of our program as this big whole completed project and asking you to focus down to an individual function or an individual class can be difficult. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means you might not be good at isolating. We're good at aggregating and it's harder to move in the opposite direction. But this is something we should be good at and the only way you get it good at it is continue to practice. So there are a lot of benefits to writing unit tests. First and foremost, it is a safety net. It is my understanding of how the software should work. That's all a unit test is, is saying, I think this is how this piece of code should work. And then you actually run it. And if it does what you'd expect it to, your tests pass. I don't hate failing unit tests. I love failing unit tests. They're like a circuit breaker in my house. If I plug in too many appliances, do I want to burn out my entire system or do I want to just burn out one little fuse? And each unit test is a fuse in your code base. You don't want one bug to spread through the entire application. You want that tiny isolated part of the code to break so you know exactly where you need to go to fix it. So unit tests are a wonderful safety net because they immediately tell you when something goes wrong. I just rolled off a project literally on the Friday before I flew over here. I was working with a, a company that's writes software for American Indian tribes, for Native Americans. And one of the last things I wanted to do before I move on was I wanted to upgrade all of our dependencies. I wanted to upgrade, this was a mean application, so I wanted to upgrade our Angular to the latest version. I wanted to upgrade Node and I wanted to upgrade Ex uh, Express and all the different pieces. So I sat down in just over a day and upgraded each dependency one at a time. And what I did was I upgraded the dependency, ran my unit tests. If they all passed, I said, yep, we're in good shape. So I was able to upgrade the next one, was able to upgrade the next one. There were a couple of times when it didn't work. We were using Mongo's 3.8. whatever, and they had upgraded to 4.0. whatever. I made that change, and boy, did I have failing unit tests. It was like a fireworks display. I had unit tests failing all over the place. And I wasn't upset. I was happy. Those were my fuses going off all over the place. I said, no, we're not ready. I was able to dial Mongoose back to 3.8. All my unit tests passed. And I was able to move on. Without that safety net, you can't refactor fearlessly. How many of you are afraid of the software that you were working on back at the job? I hope no one raises their hand, but there are a lot of people who are, right? They go into work every morning and program kind of like this because they don't quite know what's going to go wrong. Something's going to go wrong, but we don't know what. And software is all about change. If you are afraid to change your code, you're doing it wrong, aren't you? Yeah. So unit tests, in addition to facilitating change, they also simplify integration greatly. Because if you trust the individual parts, you should trust them as they come together. I like saying that unit tests are not about testing the building, but testing the individual bricks. You have to trust the individual bricks before you feel comfortable building an entire building out of them. So being able to trust the bricks is very important, especially when we begin focusing on integration. Writing good unit tests encourages best practices. Because what's really interesting is when you write some code and it only does one thing in your application, you're never quite sure what hidden dependencies you have. 
We were working on a project, JS Reports, uh, on uh, Node.js. And what had happened was we were on a weekly deployment schedule. So we deployed last Friday, and everything worked. And then we deployed the next Friday, and things started breaking. And we couldn't figure out why, because none of the version numbers had changed of all of our dependencies. And it certainly couldn't be our code, right? What we found was it wasn't our main dependency, JS Report. It was one of the transitive dependencies that JS Report had. But it was so tightly coupled that we couldn't get past that. We had to roll back a bunch of code because of one tiny bug far down in the dependency tree. You don't want to be tightly coupled. You can tell as a Java developer by how many imports you have to bring in to write a unit test. You can tell as a JavaScript developer by how many script sources you have to bring in. If in order to test one function, you need to bring in Angular, and jQuery, and Lodash, and Twitter Bootstrap, and, 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 and. That's a great example of something that is tightly coupled. Yeah. Now, the flip side of tight coupling is high cohesion as well. We said that unit tests are all about inputs, outputs, and assertions. And if you have a function that does one and only one thing very, very well, you can say that it's a highly cohesive function. And so if you have functions that do one thing very, very well, that don't have a lot of unnecessary dependencies on a lot of different other functions in there, a lot of hidden side effects, if you will, then you have highly cohesive, loosely coupled code. And by writing unit tests, it helps tease out those qualities. Code that is naturally testable tends to be highly cohesive and loosely coupled. Does that make sense? Yeah? Good. Good. Are you able to sleep? I know it's early. Would you like me to lower my voice so you can, uh, yeah? Can I catch anything? No? All right. OK, good. Well, there's one more thing that I like about unit tests. And this is one of my favorite features of unit tests. They are a form of executable documentation. What do we mean by that? Well, whenever I start on a new project, and I'm starting on new projects all the time. I'm a consultant. That's what I do. What do you think I ask to see when I start on a new project? Do I ask to see the Word documents? Of course not. Why don't I want to see the Word documents? Because when were they written? Before you wrote a single line of code, right? The Word documents are out of date the minute you start implementing the product that that Word document was meant to describe. Because how often does that Word document get updated? Never. So what are unit tests then? Unit tests are now my form of executable documentation. They're running constantly. If your Word document is inaccurate, it's easy to ignore. If your unit tests are breaking, you don't ignore those. You fix them right away. So when I start a new project, one of the first things I do is I say, show me the tests. And if they say, we don't have any tests, that tells me something else, doesn't it? Yes. But if they do have tests, I end up seeing things like this. Test for null customer. Test for inactive customer. Test for new customer. Test for new yet not yet activated. Test for existing customer. What do those five unit tests tell you already? Tell us that customers can be in a number of different states, right? And so just by looking at the unit tests, I can tell what the software is supposed to do far better than I could looking at two-year-old, out-of-date Word documents. Yeah? Executable documentation. So. If you don't have enough time to write the tests, another common argument I hear is, well, okay, we write these tests, but boy, we just don't have enough time to run them. Well, then write your tests in the first place, right? But if it takes too much time to run your tests, you're also doing it wrong. 
when people start talking about mocking out pieces of your application, we'll talk about that in just a second, this is not what they're talking about. That's not the car you want to be behind on the streets of Bangalore, right? They're doing it wrong there as well, aren't they? But this is going to give us an opportunity to talk about the difference between unit tests and functional tests. Because if your tests are taking too long to run, chances are good you're writing the wrong kind of test, which is making it take so long to run. So remember what we said about unit tests. Our unit tests are meant to isolate the individual pieces of code. We're trying to test the bricks, not the building. So the minute you find yourself talking to a database, is that isolating your code? No. The minute you find yourself making a web services call, is that isolating your code? No, not at all. I told you this is hard for us to do. What can we do to whittle these things down so we really can isolate our code? Because that is the definition of a unit test. A unit test that has as few dependencies on the other aspects of your code as humanly possible. So if you are talking to databases, if you are making web services call, if you are talking to an inordinate number of other modules, if in order to test this one function, you need to create a person object, and a household object, and a house object, and a shopping cart, and, 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 that's the very definition of high coupling. That's hard code to test. And if you have to do all those things, well, we need to find a better way to accomplish that. Because there are many ways to see if you still have staplers. There's staples in your stapler, right? Does that feel like it's the most effective form of uh, testing there? No? Would you, pref would you prefer to run this test with mock staples or real staples in your stapler? Either way, you're going to figure out that there are staples in your stapler or not. One is going to be far less painful than the other. Yeah? Help me out. Who's that gentleman on the left? Do you recognize him? Who is it? You said it, yeah? Elvis, exactly. Yes, that's Elvis. Is it really Elvis? Or is it mock Elvis? It's a mock object, isn't it? Yes. It is someone who is Elvis-like. It's someone who implements the Elvis interface, right? But he is a mock Elvis. He is good enough to stand in for Elvis for the purposes of our tests without actually having to deal with real Elvis. Do you recognize the woman standing next to him? Mock Marilyn Monroe, exactly, yes. So these are mock objects, and these are what we should be doing in our unit tests to isolate ourselves from databases and web services calls and things like that. Wikipedia, once again, says that mock objects are simulated objects that mimic the behavior of real objects in a controlled way. All of that sentence is important. Let's unpack that a little bit. It's meant to mimic the object. So instead of talking to a database, it should behave like your database. Instead of making a web services call, it should behave like that web service call. It's meant to be a replacement for the real objects. But the reason you're using a mock object is twofold. It's not only to free yourself from all those external dependencies, but it's also so that you can control the mock object. It's very hard to simulate a server running out of disk space. But it's easy to do if you have a mock database file system in place. It's very hard to demonstrate a network failure, but it's easy to do if you have a mock object that can mimic the behavior that you want it to do, especially failure states. So good mock objects have a lot of good qualities to them. It can help you if you've got non-deterministic values out there. It can make them deterministic. It can help you if it has states that are difficult to create or reproduce. But most importantly, remember what we talked about? Our unit tests take too long to run. Well, if you're not using mock objects, of course they take too long to run. You've probably seen charts like this at various times in your career. What it's doing is that it's listing out relative speeds 
starting with the fastest, which is CPU speed, and going down to the very slowest, which is sending a TCP packet from California to the Netherlands and back. And so when we measure our CPUs in megahertz, right, that is billions of transactions per second. And those are big numbers and small numbers simultaneously. It's hard to get our minds wrapped around it. So what I like about this chart is if we round up one CPU cycle to one second, something that we're a little bit more familiar with, then you can see how quickly the time it costs to go across these little devices, not in real terms, but in those relative terms. So if you're doing something when it's already on the CPU, you can see that's measured in seconds. What happens if what you're looking for is not on the CPU, but it's in RAM? Relatively speaking, you go from a three second, six second, nine second transaction to six and a half minutes, relatively speaking. So the difference between going from CPU to RAM is quite significant. What about the difference between going from RAM to sending 2K, two kilobytes of information on a really fast, closed, gigabit network, all of a sudden you've moved from minutes to hours. What happens if you have to go to a hard drive? Well, you're going from hours to days, or possibly even months. And then that last one I told you, relatively speaking, the time it takes for a packet to go from California, Netherlands, and back, 15 years. So yes, if your unit tests are taking too long to run, you've heard the old joke, hey doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, quit doing that, yeah? If your unit tests are taking too long to run, quit doing that. Quit talking to databases. Quit talking to networks. Quit talking to file systems. Mock those things out so they will run at CPU speeds. Mock them out so that you can make the behavior deterministic. Mock them out so you can make these things do what you want them to do so you can test what you need to test. How are you doing? So far, so good? Yeah? All right. Well, can you feel the excitement building? Here we are. The number three thing. The number three thing. The number three reason why developers don't test their code. It's not my job. How many of you are parents? How many of you have children at home? Yeah? As a parent, I know exactly what you were thinking because I'm a parent too, right? The minute my son says, hey, dad, that's my, not my job. Guess what, Christopher? It's now your job. Yeah? Yeah? It's not my job. I don't like that excuse at all. I was working with a client, and uh, I had a developer take a very creative approach to this. He said, you know... I know the folks in the QA department. They have families. They really need this job. If I started writing unit tests, they could be out of a job. I said, oh, that's so nice of you. You're real givers, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're real, uh, real givers. Yeah, no, it's not my job. Mm -mm. No. You know, hacker is a term. In the early days, it was a compliment. When you said, oh, I've got this brand new computer and I got this brand new printer over here and I gotta get these things talking together and so you get heads down and drink lots of coffee and you work on it for 36 hours and finally, oh, whew, it works. I've got this computer talking to this printer. That is the definition of a hacker, isn't it? Someone who through sheer grit, grit and determination is able to get their software written. Hacker doesn't always have to be a bad thing. But let me say something about software development as opposed to hacking. Dear friend of mine, Neil Ford, good friends with Venkat and Jeff Brown. Neil was here uh, last year, yeah? Yeah? He says this, he says famously that testing is the engineering rigor of software development. But say that again, testing is the engineering rigor of software development. 
And what he's trying to say in so many words is this is the difference between a hacker and a professional software developer. Because we're all paid very well in here, yeah? It's good doing what we do. I like being a software developer. But if you are going to be a grown-up software developer, you're less interested in just making it work at any cost and more interested in making sure that that software is well engineered, that it's maintainable in the long run, that it's extensible. That is engineering rigor right there. Not that, oh, whew, I got that done. But something that's going to be reproducible and testable and maintainable in the long run. When I am interviewing software developers, I already know what languages they code in. That was on their resume. I already know what projects they're working on. When I am interviewing new software developers for a project, I immediately begin talking to them about how they test their code. Because it doesn't matter how long you've been in the industry. It doesn't matter how many languages you know or how many web frameworks you know. If you are not testing your code, and can't talk about it, you're not a senior software engineer, despite what it says on your business card or your resume. Because time and time again, I find the most mature, the most reliable, the best software developers are the ones that embrace testing that can talk about how well their code is tested, that even volunteer it. Yeah, I'm working on this project over here. We're only at about 97% code coverage, but I hope to get that last 3% done soon. That means a whole lot more to me than, hey, did you see this project I banged out over the weekend? Big difference, yeah? And here's the dirty little secret that these software engineers already know, not hackers. These senior software engineers know. And what they know is you really don't write unit tests to catch bugs. And that sounds heretical, but it's really the case. The reason why I don't, the reason I do write unit tests is not to catch bugs. It's because unit testable code is intrinsically better code. It's better written because someone has taken the time to isolate it from all those other things. Someone has taken the time to figure out what the inputs are, what the expected outputs are. Testable code is highly cohesive and loosely coupled in all these things that we talk about. Even if you never find a single bug, those unit tests provide great, great value. Let's say you do find a bug in your code base and you write a unit test to capture that. Once you fix the bug, do you delete the unit test? No, of course not. These unit tests grow over time to make sure, okay, there was a problem, and there was a problem, and there was a problem. And again, like executable documentation, you get the history of your application in unit tests. When I come to an organization, I find a bunch of unit tests clustered around certain areas. They tend to be areas like security. They tend to be financial areas, things like that. When I see a whole bunch of unit tests clustered around the financial module, what does that tell you as a software developer? What do you know about that module? It's complicated. It's dangerous. It's crucial to the success of this product. Absolutely, there are lots of things you can tell forensically just by the number of unit tests gathered around certain areas of the code base. All right. We're making good progress here. <laughs> the number two reason why software developers don't test their code. <sighs> Wouldn't it be just easier to rely on integration tests and just call it a day? Well, yeah. But remember what I said earlier? That it's the software developers' responsibility to write unit tests. I typically find that it's the QA department that is the one that writes the integration tests. So again, when a software developer says, oh yeah, it's just easier to catch that in integration tests, what are they telling you once again? Uh-huh. Yeah, we're a smart bunch. 
You know, my son, Christopher, just turned 13, and he is lazy. Oh, he is lazy. And so I laughed to my wife. He's going to either have a long career as a software developer or a criminal. We can't tell which, <laughs> right? But they're both lazy. We have to decide. That's his superpower, laziness. We have to decide if we can focus his superpower for good or for evil. Yes? Because laziness as a software developer is a good thing as well. It stops you from recreating the wheel. This isn't good laziness, though, is it? Yeah, not at all. All right, pop quiz. When you're trying to plan out your project and you've, you've figured out all the key areas and you find one area that particularly scares you, one high risk area, when should you focus on that high risk code? At the start of the project or at the end of the project? Of course, why? Because it's dangerous, because it's risky. We want to give ourselves lots of time to make sure that this core piece of functionality works as advertised. So yes, you take the riskiest, most important aspects of your code, and you do them first, not last. Here's a follow-up question. When is time typically most scarce on your software development project? At the beginning of the project or at the end? And we never have enough time at the end of the project, do we? So when did you want to write your unit tests again? That doesn't make any sense at all, does it? You are purposely saying, this is the least important part of my project, and I might run out of time, and I might not do it at all. That's not good. That's not good at all. It may sound like I'm not a fan of integration tests. I really am. I'm a big fan of integration and functional tests. But I'm assuming that I'm talking to software developers. You all raise your hands. We're software developers here. So it's important for us to understand what our role is in a project and what QA's roles are. And integration tests are every bit as important as unit tests because they do good things. They make sure the entire system works. What good is a building if it falls down? Well, I tested the bricks. Can you build a building without testing the bricks? No, of course not. Can you build a building without testing the building? No, of course not. We need to have two different organizations, two different people, two different roles, two different kinds of tests. And integration testing is easier for non-programmers to do. As a matter of fact, I like making the distinction between black box testing and white box testing. You given a box, can I see what's inside of the box? If you can't see what's inside of the box, that's black box testing. That's great for a QA team. That's great for functional acceptance tests. A QA team would say, well, I click in this field and fill it in, and click on this field and fill it in, and click on the submit button, and I expect this other thing to happen over there. And they can deal with that just through the behavior of the application, not seeing individual lines of code. So it's important to have black box testers, but it's also important to have white box testers. And white box testing is unit testing. And once again, that's why it's so important for us to take that responsibility. Because we are the people who are writing the code. So we are best informed to know how our code is going to fail. Sometimes we just write our own happy path tests because we are optimists, right? I will never encounter a bug. The network will never be down. The file system will never be full. So let's make sure we happy path test. But as a white box tester, you can put on your pessimist pants and you can also say, well, here's what would happen if it did fail. And here's what would happen if the network does go down. And here's what would happen if these things would go. So you can see from a white box unit testing perspective, you want to have someone focusing on the possible failure states. And then from a black box perspective, you want people saying, what happens if I give someone a last name and not a first name? What happens if I say that they are negative 70 years old? Yeah. So having a combination of both black and white box testing are absolutely the pros of writing integration tests. But there are cons. There are cons as well. We've talked about how they're slower to run. The very definition of an integration test is integration, right? And so this is our opportunity to have databases involved, have web servers up and running, make network calls, things like that. On this last project, our unit tests would run in about a minute, minute and a half. Two minutes tops, right? And that's about the right order of magnitude for your unit tests. They should run in minutes and not 
tens of minutes. But our integration tests, even on a very small project, we haven't even gone to beta yet, our integration tests took 12, 15 minutes to run. So you can see the value of isolating your code. Those unit tests run in 90 seconds, and our integration tests run in 20 minutes. Both are valuable. Both are important. And it's also important for us not to conflate the two. The interesting thing about unit tests, excuse me, integration tests, are all the pieces have to be done in order to test them. I was working for an organization, Digital Globe. We were uh, the uh, imagery provider for uh, Google Maps back in 2005. And when I came in, I was writing software for a satellite that hadn't launched yet. That's a neat trick, isn't it? And we couldn't wait until the satellite was in orbit in order to write the software that controls it. That would be a problem as well, right? So what did we do? We had a mock satellite. Yes, we programmed against the mock satellite or piece of code that mimics the behavior of the real satellite. We made sure everything was OK. And then, of course, as you flip between your mock and integration tests, that can tell you things as well. We were doing a lot of messaging. And so in my mock service, I would get a block of XML and process it and go. When we flipped the bit to the production system, I was getting different XML. So of course, all my unit tests failed. Everything failed catastrophically. So what did we have to do? Well, we had to upgrade the mock. We made sure that our unit tests passed using our mock satellite. And once they passed using the mock satellite, we flipped over to integration testing. And if it worked with the real satellite, can you see what that did for us? It gave us a deeper understanding of what that satellite would do. But then did I just start writing all my unit tests against the real satellite? No, of course not. Because I'm not going to crash a satellite just to make sure one of my unit tests passes. Yeah? So those mocks continue to be important so I can put that mock satellite into a state we hope it's never, ever going to be in. A fiery ball coming straight towards you. No, we don't ever want to have that happen. But the most important thing, and this is what I said earlier, that testable code is intrinsically well-written code. And this is why so many people advocate TDD, or test-driven development, or test-first development. Because if you are the first one to consume your API before you try to do any kind of integration, you know whether or not the API feels good. You know whether or not you like the way those things work. You're testing the brick, but you're actually designing the brick early on. Unit tests are incredibly important when it comes to well-designed code. All right. Oh, this is the moment we've all been waiting for, right? The number one reason why software developers don't test their code. But it compiles. Oh, boy. Let me disprove this to you in one line of code. There it is. Int test chord equals 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, there's some interesting things about this. I'm assuming that a test score is being graded on a 100-point scale, right? I'm sorry, you use the metric system over here. It's still graded on a 100-point scale, right? Yeah? So does that look like a valid test score? When you get your test back from your instructor, do you just say, I got a 2,345% on my last test? Yeah? No. No. And so right here, we see that this is indeed a valid integer, but it's not a valid test score. And. It will compile, but that doesn't mean it's correct. Yeah? And this concept right here is the most crucial one. I find that junior developers focus on syntax. 
And that's to be expected. If you're brand new to a language, you're just learning JavaScript, you're just learning Clojure, you're just learning a new language, you absolutely are going to be focused on syntax. Where do I put the semicolon? Where do I put the round parenthesis? Where do I put the curly brace? But what you find is very early on, syntax becomes deeply uninteresting. And the semantics are one of the biggest difference between junior developers and senior developers. Senior developers understand what the code is supposed to do. And it really doesn't matter how it was implemented. I don't care if it was written in JavaScript or Groovy or Clojure. The semantics are what are important to this. And so what I like saying is that a compiler is a syntax checker and unit tests are semantic checkers. And arguably the fact that your code is semantically correct is far more important that you've punctuated your code correctly. Because syntax is punctuation, nothing more. So a junior developer might see an age as an integer, but we say no, an age isn't an integer. An age is an age. An age happens to be an integer, but it has a whole bunch of business rules associated with it. It's a positive integer. It's an integer that probably has an upper boundary of about 100 years, right? If we're talking about humans, it does. What if we're talking about turtles on the Galapagos Island? Well, then it's a couple of years, a couple of hundred years. What if we're talking about rocks in the Grand Canyon? Then it's thousands or millions or even billions of years. So you can see age is far more than just an int. It has all kinds of rich semantics, maximums and minimums. And are you already writing the unit tests in your head? That's what we should be thinking of. Is this a valid age or an invalid age? What does it mean to be an invalid age? What inputs would cause those assertions to fail? Negative ages, age too big, all kinds of things. Because very often you aren't dealing in primitives, you're dealing in larger classes. And no compiler in the world can tell you whether or not you have a valid person. Yeah? That is beyond the simple, mundane syntax checking that a compiler is meant to do. Maybe your person needs a first name and a last name. Maybe they need a salary. Maybe they need address. Maybe they need multiple addresses. None of these requirements will get caught by a compiler. Every single one of those requirements will get captured and validated by a unit test. So as we're trying to grow from young apprentice developers to journeyman developers to experienced senior software engineers, we find that syntax is oftentimes the least interesting part of the project you're working on. It's the semantics. It's the business rules that we should all be living for. Because at the end of the day, this is the sign that should be at the door of every software engineering shop, right? You must be this tall in order to have this job. Yeah? Because if this is your code base, I apologize. It's early in the morning, isn't it? We don't need to see this. When is he going to get off this slide? Why is he making me stare at this slide for so long? I apologize. But at this point, is this a healthy code base? No. This is someone that said, I'm going to start exercising next week or next month or next year. This is someone who's saying, we don't have time to write unit tests. We'll get to that, right? We'll, we'll, we'll have time at the end of the project, right? Yeah? This is not a healthy code base at all. This is what we should aspire to. This is what our code base should look like. And while everyone thinks they look like the guy in the background, including me, do, can, can you see the resemblance? Hold on, hold on, let me suck in my gut. There we go. <gasps> yeah, 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 no. Everyone would like to be the guy in the back. No one would like to be the child in the front. But I would argue this is what your code base should look like. 
Oh, not that. No, 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 no. This is what your code base should look like. Young and healthy. This kid up front is our minimum viable product, isn't he? Yeah. And eventually he'll grow in to this bodybuilder of a project right here. But he has all of the attributes he needs of a healthy software project. He's young, he's lean, he's in fit, he's got 100% code coverage around him. He's going to turn out all right. We can absolutely see what he's going to grow up into eventually. So yes, there is a minimum height in our profession. And you know what that minimum height is? Engineering rigor. It is testing. That is the, you must be this tall to work in our industry sign. That should be posted at every door. Because we've looked through these different excuses, and at the end of the day, that's all they really are, aren't they? Excuses. And bad ones at that. We need to be writing tests, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year. We need to be writing tests right here, right now. Hopefully tomorrow when you get back to the office, yeah? And when I come back next year and I ask how many of you are writing unit tests, do you promise me that every single one of you will raise your hand next year? Yes? Wonderful. Because everyone talks about testing their software it's time for us to finally do something about it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it.